Okay, welcome to week three of basic uh, television techniques and procedures. And uh, this week we are going to be introducing the subject of cameras and lenses. Now, last week we um, demonstrated how to set up the camera. Now we're going to talk about optics and how optics work uh, because this is incredibly important to video and film and photography and everything else. Okay, so cameras and lenses, basic optics. Okay, so cameras and lenses, the first thing to understand is there's more than one way to do this. So first of all, not every camera even has a lens. Let's start with that. So if you look at this illustration up here, this is an example of a pinhole camera. A pinhole camera doesn't even have a lens. All it has is a hole in it. And believe it or not, that is perfectly all right. Especially if the hole is very small, you can get some very sharp pictures with a pinhole camera. You can even make one yourself. Uh, but that's not necessarily always going to be the best way to do it. Now, there's also such a thing as the fixed lens camera. Now, if you look at this image over here, that is an example of a fixed lens. Uh, it may look familiar to you because if you look at older Instamatic cameras, they just have that, the singular lens, which is basically a pinhole camera with a magnifying glass on it. And that basically describes your cell phone. I don't think you can see this here. Uh, but we'll try anyway. What the heck? Now, if I hold up my cell phone and I hold it right up there, see if I can get the light on it. You can see, looks like there's two Pinot cameras there. You've got one on the microphone. And you can see the little glint of that fixed lens there. Okay, so let's just, I'm not going to do that again. Don't worry. All right, so the fixed lens uh, would be probably the least um, accurate or interesting lens that you can have. Uh, but it will give you the, uh, uh, the least amount of, of trouble as well, meaning that it's just going to take a wide-angle view of everything. Also, the GoPro camera works that way. It has a single lens that it just basically gives you everything in front of the camera. And then from there, uh, you can pick and choose what you want. Now, for example, if you're using your cell phone camera, uh, you can't really zoom in or out, at least not, not truly, uh, because there is no optics in the camera. Okay, so a prime lens is a single lens that actually has uh, at least respectable lens elements. Now, if you look down here at this third illustration I found here, uh, this can be any lens, really. If the television camera has a lens or a still camera that you're using, DSLR, if you were to actually take the lens apart, you would see a number of pieces of glass that are basically focusing and channeling the light uh, to the pickup chip in the back of the camera. So good lenses are designed this way to give you nice, reliable results uh, and uh, optical quality, uh, particularly at a certain range, meaning that depending on what the focal length is, which we'll talk about that in a minute. And I mentioned that most, uh, most TV lenses, most DSLR lenses have multiple lens elements, so we're not talking about just one piece of glass, and really that's all you have to know. Now, a zoom lens takes it a little bit further, and it gives you a motion within the lens barrel. So if I can look at this one and I can move one of these lenses back and forth, I'm actually changing the characteristics of the lens uh, while I'm going along. You can do that. That's a zoom lens. And we'll talk about what that actually means in a minute also. So let's talk first about focal length. Now, focal length uh, is basically the angle of the camera, what the camera sees, what the lens allows you to see. And so uh, it's the difference, uh, the, it's defined as the distance between the optical center of the lens and the camera frame. So if you were to look at this illustration here, you got this lens, which lens can be anything. So from that lens, assuming there's a camera built around it, there's a camera sensor or a piece of film or whatever it is, and however far away this lens is from that sensor is referred to as the focal length. Now, you might imagine that since there are different types of cameras and lenses and, and different types of film, that's not always going to be the same number. And that's true. You can have some cameras that were an 80 millimeter lens, for example, maybe a very different uh, than an 80 millimeter lens in another type. But fortunately, with television, you really don't have to worry about that. Uh, but here, you notice that if the lens is further away, the entire characteristic of what the angle of view gives you is going to be different. And that's really what we're talking about here. So if we move on, 
let's say we have this a short focal length, which is called a wide angle lens. If we have the lens really close to that uh, camera sensor, uh, this angle is going to expand. And so essentially that's zooming in or zoom, zooming out rather. And so you see more of the scene in front of you. And to understand how focal length works, um, let me first say, sorry about that, normal lens, talk about normal lens for a minute. So that's medium focal length. So we got them all up here now. So a normal lens would be, if you hold out your arms like this, you should be able to see your fingers within your peripheral vision. And so you have just experienced normal vision. And so if you look ahead and you look at something in front of you, then you're going to see whatever is directly in front of you. You're also going to see stuff off to the side. And so a normal lens is a focal length that's set up in such a way that the camera mimics human vision. And so generally speaking, if you buy a DSLR, uh, the, the lens it's going to come with is close as possible to a normal lens. And so then, if you say, well, you know, this lens is good, but I'm taking family photos and I can't get everybody into the picture. So maybe you want a wide angle lens, which allows you to see more, which deliberately widens that field of view and gives the camera a greater field of view than human beings normally have. And to do that, you would bring the lens closer to the camera sensor, the optical center, and you create a short lens. And lenses actually are long or short. You can actually see them. Now, a telephoto lens, which is a long lens, that does the opposite. It pushes the lens element further away from the sensor and narrows that viewpoint. So if you look at the view ahead of you and you contract the viewpoint and only look at something directly in front of you, uh, then really what you're doing is you're magnifying that. So you're excluding everything else. So it makes things look closer than they really are. And so that gives you the effect of a telescope. Now the angle, it's important to understand how this works. A normal lens, as we say, gives you human vision. Uh, wide angle lenses distort distance. Now, we've already said that they, get, they, they give you a, a greater field of view, which means they're automatically distorting distance. But um, that would start, if that's, if that's all it did, we wouldn't really have a problem with it. But what it also does is it makes everything look further away, which further away than it actually is. Now, telephoto lenses contract the distance. And so if you, if you think of it that way, you're making you know, things look, look closer than they really are. Uh, then if you have two people, one three feet away from the other, a telephoto lens is going to make them look like they're right up on each other. Whereas a wide angle lens could do this. It could make them look like they're further away from each other. A normal lens would more or less make it look like what you would normally see. Wide angle lenses make things look longer. That's another thing. If someone's raising, actually, this is a really good example because this is a wide angle lens. Look how long my arm looks. It looks like it's 20 feet long. Now, if this were a telephoto lens, it might look something like this. I'm reaching out in front of you. And of course, if it's a normal lens, it would look more normal. And again, telephoto lenses contract distance. Now, here's another one. You know, we've already talked about this. Wide angle lenses make things look far away. Obviously, they would. Uh, but they're not really further away. They're just giving you the impression that they're further away. And telephoto lens make far away things look closer. Again, they're not really moving any closer. They're just ignoring anything else in between. Now, here's the other thing that's important. A wide angle lens will hide camera movement. And by that, I mean, if you're going to move the camera and you've got a wide angle lens, you don't notice much of a problem. Let me demonstrate that again. This is a wide angle lens. So if I were to temporarily go here. Okay, wide angle lens. I move the camera. I move the camera a little bit. You're not really seeing all that much of a difference. Now, if I were doing that uh, with a telephoto lens, even a small distance difference in, in movement would look uh, distorted. It would look uh, exaggerated. And so uh, typically what that means uh, is if you are using a telephoto lens, you really need to use a tripod. So let me emphasize that. If you're going to be shooting handheld, zoom all the way back or get a wide angle lens because it's, it's going to give you all the help you can get. Uh, on the other hand, if you've got a telephoto lens and you're far away, 
Uh, any slight movement is going to be magnified, so you really need to lock that down. And so that's why tripods are there. Uh, it's not to say you can't do that. Uh, if you want to understand this further, just look at a telescope. If you have a small telescope and you're trying to find a planet, you're going to find that you're, you're swinging all over the sky trying to find a small object. And you literally can't because you can only see little bitty range. And so you've got to... You gotta aim the thing pretty close to where it is without even looking into it before you can even get started. Okay, so that's the basics of focal length. Now, iris and exposure, yeah, it's important to understand how this works. Now, let's talk about iris first. Uh, the an iris or a lens opening is a hole, literally a hole in the lens. Uh, not, not a hole in the actual glass, but if you think of the lens barrel, uh, then that is an, an opening within the camera that allows light to enter. And so if you've got a large hole like this, you know, that is letting in more light than a small hole like this. Obviously, the larger the hole, the more light comes in. Now, you might notice on your camera lenses, not all of them these days, but you should see these markings called f-stops. Now, uh, the, uh, the f is not really an f. You know, when you see it listed there, it's, it's not like uh, F as in Frank. Uh, it's it's uh, more like F as in function. So it's a mathematical term. So uh, don't worry if you can't figure out where that comes from. But let me explain how it would work. Uh, let's pretend we have a very small camera. And if we're looking at this, let's say that the focal length of this camera is exactly the diameter of this lens. So... Basically, if you were to look at the optical center of the lens and go to the pickup tube, then that distance would exactly match the diameter of this lens. That would be f1. So, so, so that distance would be the same all the time. Now, on the other hand, let's say you have that same camera and you go to f22. This diameter would fit into that, that, uh, that space 22 times. So that's a way to understand why the numbers are literally going backwards, but that's really all you have to know. Okay, the larger f-stops give you the smaller openings. So f22 is a smaller opening than f2.8. Smaller f-numbers equal larger openings. Obviously, you would think that the converse would be true. Now, getting into depth of field, is uh, this is actually among the hardest things to discuss, but what it really means is uh, the range at which items in, the, in, the, in your, your viewpoint remain in focus. So, for example, if we look at this illustration that I found somewhere, let's say you've got this person standing here, and you focus on that person. Now, um, to understand focus, it's based on distance. So if you're, if you're like five feet away from this person, and you focus the lens in such a way that five feet is considered in focus, if you have a shallow depth of field, it's gonna look something like this down here. So you may get a little bit of focus if you're a little closer, a little bit of focus further away, but something back here gets all blurry. So if you have a wide depth of field, uh, then same focus point, everything is in focus from beginning to end. And so from, from way up close, way out to what's called infinity, everything's in focus. So this is a range of focus to, to go over it again. Focus equals distance. A wide depth of field means everything is in focus. A shallow depth of field makes it more narrow. And so that's the first thing to understand. Now, if you have a short lens, like a wide angle lens, obviously, uh, that is going to influence your depth of field. It's important to understand this because a lot of things can influence your depth of field, or at least uh, more than one. Uh, so a wider lens opening, if you have a wide angle lens, because it elongates distance, what it will do is it will give you a greater depth of field. More things are going to be in focus. So if you know you've got a lot of uh, things you want in focus in your shot, you might be better off with a wide angle lens than a telephoto. Longer lenses narrow the depth of field. And larger f-stops widen the depth of field. So if you've got a really small lens opening, that's going to give you more depth of focus. So it's important to, to know that you can do that. 
Because that's something you can control whether, even if you get a bad focal length. And the smaller f-stops give you a narrow range of focus. And so if you are if you have to open the lens all the way at, say, f2.8, uh, that could give you a very narrow depth of field, and there's not much you can do about that. Okay, and I've got this little chart here, or this series of charts. Now, if you look on the left-hand side here, and this is represented as a long lens, it looks long, and you can see the range of focus that you're likely to get, all things being equal, meaning that they're they're listed at the same at the same uh, f-stop. And a normal lens might give you more in focus, and of course, a wide-angle lens or a short lens would give you a greater range of focus in which things are in focus. So, uh, and at the same time, looking over here, if you've got somebody in focus here and you've got f2.8, you may get blurry people in the foreground and very blurry people in the background. And at f8, uh, you might get a wider range of focus. At f16 or f22, whatever is larger, you may get everything in focus. And so that's basically how to control depth of field. And uh, one of the things that you might want to realize is you don't necessarily always want everything in focus. Sometimes you want to blur out the background, in which case you would deliberately want a narrow depth of field. That's one of the reasons why your cell phone camera is not always your best choice, because this will always give you a wide depth of field. You can't take a blurry picture with a cell phone camera. They're designed not to. Okay, zoom lenses. Zoom lenses are very convenient. And based on what we've said so far, you might already realize that a zoom lens is a lens that has more than one focal length. Usually they're long lenses, but you can control where the optical center of the lens is. And so you can literally make the lens shorter by moving that back and forth along a track. And so you do that by adjusting the zoom control. There's like a ring on the lens, or in the case of a video camera, you, you rock forward, zoom in, zoom out, and that's a variable focal length. Now, uh, these are not as good as prime lenses, prime lenses which have only one focal length, but they're more convenient, and generally speaking, people use them more because of this convenience. And of course, in the video field, you're not really gonna be able to do much without a zoom lens because that's part of how you take your, your shots. You zoom in, you zoom out. Uh, it's become so integral to uh, shots, um, to, to, uh, to cinematography, that we just accepted it. You know, we, we don't try anymore. Okay, now one thing I'll tell you, notice a lot of people, when I said that zoom lenses, your cameras can't zoom in, and you say, well, my, my camera can zoom in. Well, if it's got one of those little pancake lenses there, you're not really zooming in. What you're doing is you're magnifying the image. You're magnifying the image after you've shot it. And so you're ignoring certain parts of the picture. So really you're just cropping it. And so don't let it fool you folks. Unless you've actually got lens elements, you can't zoom in. A digital zoom is not a zoom. And cell phone cameras have no optics. Okay. And uh, zooms are great for camera moves, which we're going to talk about next. So basic camera moves when you are shooting, you know, setting up your um, your shot, your interview, or whether it's you know, if it's uh, if it's well, let's say news gathering, you're doing an interview, you got camera moves there, uh, or you could be shooting a scene from a movie where you want to emphasize something, and so there are actually more camera moves than you're probably aware of. So I'm just going to try to summarize them. Now. I'm going to take this slow. Okay, first of all. The static shot, believe it or not, the static shot is a camera move because sometimes you actually have to work to get it, meaning that I'm going to shoot this scene without moving the camera at all. And so that means that whatever the camera is supposed to be looking at has to remain in frame. And so it could be you've got a close-up of a person talking, they're, they're doing their thing, and you're not moving the camera at all. You just want to capture that. And I'm going to say that the static shot is often a safe shot. Meaning that if you got the camera locked down, you can't screw it up. Meaning if you're afraid to do a camera because you're afraid you're going to get it wrong, you know, maybe a static shot will, will work for at least some of these things. And then you can, you can practice your moves until you feel more comfortable. Uh, now, if you do too many static shots, people will accuse you of doing a slideshow. 
uh, because sometimes uh, sometimes that can happen. Now a pan, a pan is a basic shot where you're panning the camera left or right. So you're pivoting to one side or the other to find something else. Now at this point, I'm going to tell you ahead of time, you don't want to pan unless you're panning to something. So every camera move that you do make should reveal something that wasn't in the original shot. So you've got shot A before the camera movement and shot B after the camera movement. And the in-between part is the actual shot. And so you're going to something. It could be something very simple. So, for example, tilting up and down, changing the pitch angle. So you're, you're rising, you're pointing the camera up and down. And this is different than, than, uh, than, than pedestaling, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But you're literally looking up or looking down. And uh, then if you're looking up, you've got to be looking up to something. So there's got to be some reason to look up. Same thing with looking down. And so that's, that's, a, a, legit, legit, that's a legitimate camera move. Okay, zooming in or out. Now that's a little bit different because you're not actually moving the camera. You're only moving the lens. And so once again, you're zooming in. You're emphasizing something. A nice slow zoom in uh, can have a feel of, of emphasizing your subject. You know, if someone's talking about something very intimate and you're zooming in slowly, then you're telling your audience the subject is, you're, you're getting close to this person. You're getting into their head, so to speak. Okay, so uh, let me share something real quick. One of the best camera moves I ever did was in an interview, which I knew I wasn't going to be able to shoot again. And my, uh, my talent, a person was, was talking about something very important to her. And at a certain point, I realized I, was, I didn't like to make camera moves at the time because I, was, I, I, I lacked confidence. But I realized I got to zoom in. And so I very gently moved the camera in. And of course, you've got to rock the camera up just a little bit to keep the person framed. And then you don't want to reach the end of the, end of the lens before you finish the tilt. So I ease back. And I got it. And that was, to this day, I still think that was one of the best camera moves I ever did. And I didn't go into there with the intention of doing that. Okay, dollying in or dollying out. This one you might not have heard of. Uh, and that is when you physically move the camera forward or backward. Now, you might think, well, what's the difference between that and zooming? Well, the difference is if you're moving forward or backward, you can see things go by. So you're literally changing the perspective that way. You're also changing the distance between you and the subject, which means you may have to refocus. And trucking left or trucking right, that's exactly the same as dialing, except now you're going right or left. And sometimes you would do this on a track. You have a track system set up, which we have one, by the way, if you ever need one. And so you can move along a track and uh, see, and basically it's kind of like a, like a train car moving by. And maybe that's the effect you want. You can get that with a dolly. You know, dollying in, dollying out, trucking left, trucking right, either way. Now, pedestal up and down, you're physically raising the camera on an elevator. So the reason why they call that pedestal is because most studio cameras are on these very large elevated pedestals, uh, which have uh, gas or fluid inside them under a great deal of pressure. So you can literally lift the camera up with one finger. And so it's counterbalanced. And of course, if something goes wrong with that pedestal, it can make a lot of noise and you can actually get hurt. Fortunately, that doesn't usually happen. Okay, arcing left and arcing right is a little bit more difficult to explain. You're literally moving at an angle. You're sort of, it's kind of like combining trucking and, and dollying to get kind of, a, it's like you're, you're moving in a semicircle around your subject. In all of my time doing this, I've never done an arc shot, but I'm not saying you shouldn't think of it. Craning up and craning down. That is when the camera is in a basket and you're lifting it up on a crane. And then you're bringing it back down again or you're moving the crane over this way. And uh, it is a very different type of shot than simply pedestaling up and down. Uh, and uh, it's something that you really have to think about before you do. Uh, a crane can take a long time to set up. But that doesn't mean it's, uh, it's the wrong thing to do. If you want a crane shot, get a crane shot. I love crane shots. I've done a few of them. Now, I mentioned drone here because these days it is easier to use a camera drone 
than a crane because you don't have to set up the drone. You just got to float it around there. And if, if you're good at it, uh, it saves you enormous amounts of time because the, uh, the crane shot uh, is, is, it comes with its own problems. You're nowhere near the camera, so you can't see in the camera's viewfinder, which means you've got to run a line from the camera to a field monitor, and you also can't control the zoom unless you run control cables, which you can do, of course. And so by the time you set all that stuff up, you've lost a half an hour. And so if, you're, if you've got a drone, you can just hover the drone around, do the shot a few times, and once you feel you've got it, fine, you're done. Rack focus is the last one we'll mention here, and that is when you're focusing on a subject in the foreground, and then you change focus to make them blurry and the person in the background in focus. That is also a camera move. So, once again, every camera movement has to reveal something. So, if you're going to do a camera movement, make sure there's a reason for it. It's like, if you zoom out just a little bit, you maybe you've reframed the shot, but why? Was there a reason for that? The audience is going to wonder. So let's say someone's talking. Uh, one of the best scenes I saw in a movie was you got somebody, uh, you're seeing them in close-up, and they say, well, that's why I'm here. And then when you zoom back, you find out that he's in, in prison. And so then you see the prison bars in front of him, which you didn't see in the close-up. And so the camera zoom revealed something that you couldn't normally see. Uh, those are, are things to think about. Every camera move has to have a purpose. Uh, most camera moves are combined with others, and we've said this before. If you're going to zoom back or zoom into a subject, you must also tilt the camera to maintain eye level, make sure that the eyes don't go up and down in the frame. And that's an, an, a rather obvious one. But you can also zoom out and pan to the right to reveal the environment that a person is in. And really, there's, there's enormous numbers of combinations. The execution is critical. I'm going to tell you this. Um, typically, if you're going to do a camera move, try to practice it at least once before you do it for real. And be willing to take multiple takes. I will tell you that I can think of very few camera moves I've ever gotten right the first try. And if I do get it right the first time, I'm going to do it again anyway because I'm not going to believe I got it right the first time. So if there's a little bit of a hitch there, if you didn't zoom out quite as fast than you should have, you know, maybe you zoomed out too quickly, you know, try it again, try to slow it down a bit, and practice. And that is, uh, that is critical, because uh, if you're going to get paid as a camera operator, you really have to know what you're doing. And so if you're marketing yourself as a camera operator, make sure you've got the, uh, you know, the, the muscle memory, as they call it. So don't just buy a camera and think you know how to do it. You know, practice it. Work with it. And remember, the camera moves control emphasis. And so it's like if there's a slow zoom in to an object on the table, that's telling the audience something about that is important or something like that. And so that's the very basics of camera optics and how they work. And what we're going to do in the class, in the lab session, it's kind of like a scavenger hunt where I'm going to ask you to do some camera moves and uh, come back with footage that we will review.